Welcome to this evening's supercalifragilisticexpialidocious Roots Magic webinar. My name is Michael Booth. I am Vice President of Roots Magic and one of its developers. And also with us this evening is the Roots Magician himself, Bruce Busby. And Bruce, of course, is the President of Roots Magic and its author. This evening's topic is Research Tools in Roots Magic. Now, most people dip their toes in the genealogy pool with a simple curiosity about their roots. But after you've recorded everything you have at hand, the family history bug bites you and you go looking for new information and solving your own puzzles. And almost without realizing it, you've come to the dreaded R word. You've become a researcher. Well, Roots Magic is there to help you with a large assortment of research tools which help you set goals, make to-do lists, track your progress, and even suggest places to look. And tonight we'll be looking at how to use these tools in the quest for those elusive ancestors. Since we're talking about research tools, we are curious about which research tools in Roots Magic have you used before. There's the fact list report, the to-do lists, correspondence lists, the web search, and GenSmarts. So if you could go ahead and just click on all of the research tools that you've used before, and we'll give you about a minute to log in your response. And here are the results. 35% of you have used the fact list report. 41% have used to-do lists. Only 9% of you have used the correspondence lists. 51% of you have used the web search and 26% of you have used GenSmarts. And so that's good. It looks like there's a lot of missing ground that we can make up for in tonight's presentation. And with that, I will turn the time over to Bruce. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Oh, well, look at this. I see a question about what about none of the above. Okay. So, yeah, there's... Uh, as Mike said, there's probably a lot of a lot of uh, area that we can cover here in helping us do our actual research. Most people usually think of a program like Roots Magic as a program to kind of plug your data in, the data that you've already found. Well, Roots Magic can actually help you find that additional data, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, what I want to do first, though, is rather than going in and immediately showing you specific research uh, tools, I want to show you some reports that will help you determine what it is you need to be doing research on. So let's go ahead and start by going into our reports. We're going to go right here. We're going to click on the little report button to bring up our reports, and we're going to go to lists. And one of the lists that we can select is called an individual list. And I'm picking the individual list because it's easy to use, but you could also go in and create a custom report if you want actually more information printed than what the individual list will give you. With the individual list, I'm just going to get a list of people that match some certain criteria. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and click on Create Report. And what I'm going to do is I am going to choose to print selected people, but I don't want everyone. When I click on Select from List, it's going to give me a list of the people that I want to include. Now, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find um, a list of people that I want to do some research on. So I could actually come in here and select a group. So if I could wanted, I could come in and say I want to mark a group of people, and I could mark the ancestors of a person or the descendants or everyone in the tree. But what I'm actually going to go is I'm going to say I want to select people by their data fields. So I'm going to go ahead and choose that, and Roots Magic is going to bring up this screen where I can tell Roots Magic, what specific people I want. So I could do something like say, I want to go find everybody who, um, let's say, their birth, date, 
is after 1860. And then I could say and or I'm going to say and their death date is before 1930. And I could go ahead and say OK right here. And what that's going to do is give me everybody who was born and lived between 1860 and 1930. Now, this is not really a very good search. I mean, this is not really, this particular search is not going to be as useful as you'd like. Uh, because anybody who was, because of, because of the fact that it says and, anybody who was born in 1859 is not going to be included. Anybody who died after 1930, uh, in 1931 or so on, is not going to be included either. Okay, but what, what I want you to notice is that there are, the, there's the ability to search on any fact in your program. So you don't have to search for just birth and death. You can actually say any fact. Okay, so I could say I want any fact date is before or is after. And so with this, and then I could say or uh, and or. So this would actually give me, if I went ahead and said any fact, any fact, this is going to give me anybody who has any fact within their life between these two dates. Okay, now let's say I happen to, ha also I'm going to go ahead and clear this, let's say I happen to use the fact called military. So I could actually come in here and say I want everybody whose military value contains, you know, whatever, uh, civil war, revolutionary war. So in other words, if I've used the military fact and kept track of what war that person served in, in that description field for the military, I can easily get a list of everybody who served in that particular war. Okay, I can also search, in addition to things like events, I can search for people based on their names. So I could actually come up, and come down here and say uh, surname, I want everybody whose surname equals Smith. Well, spell it right. Everybody whose surname equals Smith. So if I'm looking for the Smiths that served in the Civil War, I could say I want everybody whose surname equals Smith and military value equals or contains Civil War. Okay, and that's going to give me all of my Smiths who served in the Civil War. Now I could also take that even farther and any fact place contains South Carolina. So that's going to give me anybody who is named Smith that served in the Civil War and at some point in their life lived in South Carolina. So you can see this is a very powerful tool. Uh, if I click OK, I'm sure I have zero in this case. But what this would have done would have marked everybody who matched that criteria so that when I selected OK and generated that report, I would get a list of everybody who matched that criteria. Now in addition to the person's name, I can also have it include any facts in that person's life, their parents, their spouses, or their children. Uh, they're, they're, very, they're kind of hardwired pieces of information that I can include for each person. As I mentioned, if I wanted to, I could also create a custom report so that I could select that same way, but actually have it print the exact fields that I want. Okay, let's go ahead and move to another report that's going to be helpful in finding people that we need to do research on, and that's going to be the one right next to the individual list called the fact list. Now the fact list is actually a number of different reports all in one. So what the fact list lets me do is I can say give me a list of everybody with this particular fact type and I can pick whatever fact I want. Or I can say everybody who is missing this fact type. So if I'm, needing, if I'm wanting to find 
who do I need to find birth information on, I can say, give me a list of everybody missing their birth event. Okay? I can also come down and I can say, give me a list of all my facts that have sources or give me a list of my facts that don't have sources. Now, if you're like me, you probably have a lot of facts in your database that you do not have documentation or you don't have the documentation entered into your database. That's where the facts without sources comes in handy. When I click Generate Report, I am going to get a list of every fact in my database sorted alphabetically by the person's name, and I'm going to have the fact, the date, and the place. These are all the facts in my database that I do not have sources for yet. Okay, let's go back, go ahead and go back in. I can also create facts that have a source with a specific citation quality. So let's go ahead and select that. And if I do this by default, I'm going to get all the facts in my file that have a citation quality of any source, any information, any evidence. Now, if you're not sure what I'm talking about right here, this is what's called the BCG, Board for Certification of Genealogists, uh, standard for the quality of a source. Uh, if What you might want to do is you might want to go back and review our webinar on sources. We talk about this. But I'm just going to go ahead and generate this. And this is going to basically give me a list of all the events that I have sources for. Okay, now, if I go back in, I can say, oh, but what I really want is just a list of facts that I have original sources for. Okay, and I'm going to get a smaller set of that. Or I could say, uh, rather than maybe I don't care whether the source was original or derivative, I just care if it was provided by somebody with primary knowledge of that event. I just want that. And that's going to give me just the citations, just the sources that I have a primary source for. Okay, and I can mix and match these. So if I only want original primary, I can do that as well. So this particular report, this fact list, lets me do things like find information that I'm missing, facts that I just don't have any sources for at all, or facts that have a certain quality. So I might want, I might only have sources that are, that are secondary and, and derivative and, and only indirectly mention uh, the fact I'm trying to prove, and I can find out which of those I, which of those facts I actually need better source citations for. Okay, let's go ahead and move to another report here. The next report we're going to look at is called the timeline list. And what the timeline list does is you can go in and select a starting person. I will go ahead and start with this imaginary Howard Smith Jr. and go into the lists and say I want to do a timeline list. When I do that, I have a couple of different timeline lists. One I'm going to talk about is the individual timeline list. This is going to give me a list of all the events in his life. But what's great is I don't have to limit it to just his, uh, just his. So I can actually come down here and select other people that I want to include. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. And I'm going to go down and I'm going to find him, Smith, Howard, Smith, Jr. And I'm going to say, let's go ahead and mark his family. Now, I can mark any person in the database, but I'm just going to mark his family, and it asks which family, ones where he's a parent or is a child. I'm just going to go ahead and mark them all. It's going to select all of those additional people, and when I click OK and generate this report, Roots Magic is going to give me a timeline for this person. It's going to include all of the events within his life, his birth, his education, his occupation, marriage, death, and burial. And it's going to show his age at that, uh, at that event. But it is also going to include things like when his spouse was born, when his various children were born, when his parents passed away. The, the people that I select to include within that report are going to, are going to be uh, included in this report. 
so that I can actually look for trends. I can see things like, oh, look, he was married in this particular location, but his children were born in this other location, and then he somehow came back to this location. So I'm not limited to looking just at the events that happened just within his life, but the events that happened in the people's lives around him to give me context uh, to see more places that I may want to go research data for. Okay, the last report that I'm going to actually mention, and I'm not, I don't think I have actually any data in this report, in this particular database, this sample database, to actually give you a good example of this, but that would be the research notes report. Now this is a report that's actually unique to Roots Magic, and when I select the research notes report, what I can do is I can print the research notes that I have for a person or for a family. And basically what this does is as I've added sources to each fact in, my, in, in a person's life, I can not only add that source citation, in other words, the, the, the author, title, publisher, the things that make the footnote, but I can actually enter my research notes, the notes that I have about this particular source, about the usage of this source for that fact, in the actual text field for that source. When I do that, Roots Magic will actually let me create, and you can see, as I said, this is going to be blank because I don't actually have any research notes entered for this person. But what this report will do is will give me a report of what I have already collected in terms of research, in terms of sources, in terms of how I've analyzed those sources for that particular fact, for that particular person. Okay, so that's an overview of some of the reports that we have that will help get you to the point to where you kind of have an idea of what you need to start looking for. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to kind of shift gears and we're going to talk about the to-do list. Okay, Roots Magic has a to-do list and you can have a to-do list for each person in your file. You can also have a to-do list for each family in your file and you can add generic to-do items which don't necessarily have to do with any particular person or family. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here to the Lists menu. I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to come down to the To-Do List. Now when I open up the To-Do List, this is going to give me a list of all the To-Do items or tasks that I have added to this database. Now as I mentioned, this is a sample database, so we've just kind of tossed a few little ones in here uh, just to kind of get us started. Um, if you're really doing a lot of research, you will probably have quite a few to-do items in this list. So when I select or highlight one of these to-do items, it's going to show me information over on the side. Who is this to-do item for? What is the task? What is the priority and the status of it? What are the dates that I've worked on it or I started it? Where do I need to do it? And what are the details? Okay. Now I may have one like this send the database to Aunt Mary. You'll notice it's not for a particular person. It's a generic to-do item telling me, oh, I need to send a copy of my file to this person. Okay, if I go in and edit one of these tasks, I will see that I can enter what I need to do. This is just a one-line brief description, just an overview of what it is that I need to do. I can have a personal file number and what this does is if I want to keep my own filing system that ties these to-do items to my own filing system, I can use that. This is totally optional, but it's available there if you need to use it. You also have the ability to set a priority for this particular to-do item. In other words, how important is it? How quickly do I want to get to this? Okay, I have two other sections. When do I need to do it? and where do I need to do it? The when is where I can choose what my status on this is. OK, 
Okay, I can actually say this status is open, it's been completed, it's pending, or it's a problem. Now some people, when they create a to-do item, when they finish it, they just go into the to-do list and they delete it. And that's fine. If that's what you want to do, you can do that. But you can also mark to-do items as completed so that you can keep basically a running research log of the things that you have looked at and the research that you've done. There are three dates for each to-do item. There's the date you started it. And when you create a new to-do item, Roots Magic already automatically fills that in for you, but you can change it if you want. The date you last worked on this to-do item, so if you've done a little bit of work and maybe you found some results or you didn't, you can come in here and pop up the calendar and select today's date and say, okay, there's the date I last worked on it. Once you've completed this to-do item, you can mark it as completed and select the date so you can keep track of that as well. As for the where do I need to do it, you have two options. You can either select an address or you can select a repository. Now those are really two different things. The repository is going to be things like archives, libraries, courthouses, places where you would look for records, for sources. Okay, those are going to be your repositories. Addresses are going to be addresses where people live. Because sometimes you may have a to-do item that, where you say, I need to look up this person's birth certificate, and here's where I need to do it. I need to do it at the Family History Library. I need to do it at the such and such courthouse. But other to-do items are things like, I need to send this database to Aunt Mary, and so you may say, I need to put her address in as opposed to a repository. Now, of course, Mary could be a repository as well. If Mary happens to have a lot of records that you are basing your data on, she might be one of your repositories. Okay, the bottom field right here, details and results, this is just a completely freeform field where you can enter whatever you want. This is where you can put your game plan, what it is you intend to do. Um, how do you intend to go try to find this birth certificate? What, what places, um, you know, what sources, whatever you, are you possibly thinking about looking in? As you find results, as you go and find uh, information to complete this to-do item, you may want to put those results in there as well. Now, your results may be negative results. You, you might have uh, in here, uh, that you need to go search uh, such and such birth certificate. Well, maybe you look at that, maybe you find that birth certificate and it does not have what you need. Well, you're going to put those results in. I searched it and I did not find what I was looking for. And so you go on to the next step. Okay, here's the next place I'm going to look. So just because you look at a particular record and don't find what you're looking for, don't ignore that. Put that into your details and results so you can keep track of not only your successful searches, but your unsuccessful ones as well. One advantage of that is it prevents you, or hopefully it prevents you, from going and doing that search multiple times. You go in and say, oh look, I did look in there, I don't need to do that again. Okay, now I see a question about adding, adding uh, to-do list items for family and as generic. Okay, the way you would add a generic to-do item is from the main to-do list. So you click on lists, come down to the to-do list, and any task you add from this master to-do list is going to be a generic to-do item. So anything I put in right here and click OK will be a generic to-do item like sending my database to Aunt Mary. If I want to add a to-do item to a person, uh, there's a couple of ways I can do that. I can go into that person's edit screen, and from the edit screen, click the To Do button right here. When I click the To Do button, that brings up the To Do list for him. It's going to list any To Do items I have for this person. So any task that I add right here is going to be added to him. It's going to be a task assigned to him as a person. If I want to add 
a to-do item for a family, I can do that from the edit screen as well. Right, if you notice, right now I'm highlighting his name, the person row. That's why, why clicking to do right here would add the to-do item as a personal individual to-do item. If I highlight one of his spouses, that would out allow me to enter a to-do item for that family where he is married to her as a spouse. Okay, it's going to show me to-do item for Howard Smith and Floridell Jones. Likewise, if I'm highlighting the parents, it allows me to add the to-do item for the parents, Howard Smith and Phoebe Sophia Davis. Okay, now that also can be done by highlighting the person and coming up and clicking on the to-do button on the toolbar. When I click on that, you'll notice that this button has a little arrow next to it. Some of the buttons don't have arrows next to them, down arrows. If they have a down arrow, it means clicking on it's actually going to bring a little menu. And that allows me to edit the person to-do list for him, the family to-do list for him, or open up that generic to-do list items. Okay. So, so that's, that's kind of an overview of the to-do list, the actual uh, to-do list that you work with. Now, once you've added to-do items to a person, as you highlight a person on the screen, up here in this information area, if that person has any to-do items, you'll see a little to-do sticky note right there. If a person doesn't have a to-do item, for example, I'll click on James Smith, he doesn't have any to-do items, so I don't see the little sticky note. When I click on Howard, I have a little sticky note. Now, if I click on that little to-do item sticky note, it opens up his to-do list. Okay, now you'll notice he has two to-do items. Check the 1900 census for his family, and I need to find his birth certificate. Now, you'll see that the first one it shows is still open. In other words, I'm still working on that one. Needing to find his birth certificate, that one has been completed. Now, one thing you'll notice, and this is kind of a cool little feature, if I go in and edit this to-do item, and I say this one is now completed, so now both of his to-do items are complete. When I close this, if you watch that little sticky note up there, it now has a green check mark in it. Okay, If a person has to-do items, you'll get the sticky note. If all of that person's to-do items are complete, you'll get that little green check mark so that you don't have to keep going in to see, oh, he's got to-do items, are they done? I can actually tell, oh, that to-do item is actually, been, those to-do items for that person have been finished. Okay, so now let's go ahead and go into the reports once again. And again, I'm going to go in by clicking the little printer button on the toolbar, and I'm going to go into lists. And this time, the list we're going to do is called the to-do list. Okay, what the to-do list is going to do is give me the ability to print some of these to-do items that I've been entering. So I, as I go through my database, I add to-do items to each person. And these to-do items may be simple little, you know, I just need to find this document, or they may be more complicated. I need to prove this relationship. And proving that relationship may involve more than just finding a single little document. Okay, so as I add these to-do items, I'm going to come into the reports to print the to-do list. And the first option, by default, print every to-do task in the database. So let's go ahead and just do that. We're going to print every to-do task in the whole database. And so here is my to-do list. And I need to send my database to Aunt Mary. I need to check the 1900 census for his family. And for each one of these, it's going to show me who I need to do it before and when I need to do it, and, and it will also show me the date I last worked on it, and if it was completed and I entered a completed date, it will show that as well, the status and the priority, and where I need to do it. Okay, now you'll notice that some of these, there's, there's four, I have four to-do items that I've entered into this database. So let's go ahead and go into the settings and look at a couple of other things. This one was sorted by the person name, but maybe I want to sort it by the description. Okay, when I do that, it's the same four items. 
It's just sorting it alphabetically by the description of the to-do list rather than the name of the person. Before, it was grouped by the person so that, so that all the to-do items for each person were grouped together. One thing that's kind of neat is Roots Magic will, when it prints out who it's for, it will throw that sound X in, in there for you. So if you happen to need to do a sound X search uh, at the library for this person, you don't have to go calculate the sound X. It's right there on your to-do list. Okay, so I can also sort by uh, the repository name. So if I want to group it together by where the um, where I need to do the research, I can do that. Uh, I can also sort it by the open date or the priority. Now, this repository one is fairly useful, but what I actually like to do is come in and say, oh, sort, in, instead of printing all of the tasks in my database, I only want to print the ones in a particular uh, repository. So I'm going to go ahead and say, oh, I'm going to the Cache County uh, Courthouse next week print up a to-do list for that location. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. So what I'm saying is only print the to-do items that I said I needed to do at Cache County, Utah Courthouse. Go ahead and click Generate Report. And now I have a list of just those items that I need to do there. Now in this case, they're, it's marked they're both completed. So I do have some other options. I could say, you know, I'm going to do research. I don't need the ones that are completed. I just want the ones that are open. The other thing I can do is say only print tasks that with a priority of at least this high. So if I'm going to the courthouse but I only have an hour or so to spend there, I don't necessarily want to print all 50 to-do items there. I can say only print the ones that are priority one or two. And I will get just a list of the to-do items that are the highest priority. Okay. Now, there are, there are other things I can say only print the to-do items that are my general items. In other words, those, the one, those that I haven't linked to a, to a person or a family. If I do that, in this case, I'm going to get just that one about sending the database to Aunt Mary. That's going to give me a list of the to-do items that I say I need to do just in that particular location, uh, uh, just uh, that have nothing to do with a specific person. I can also say Print all the to-do to tasks for a group of people. And I get to go select what group of people. So if I'm only wanting to do, um, to do items for people whose last name is Smith, I can do that. If I only want to do tasks for people who were born in California between 1850 and 1870, I can do that. Any group of people that I select using that, that criteria search that I mentioned at the beginning of the, of the class, um, I can do that. I can also print just the to-do items for a single person, just for a single family, or just a single to-do task. In other words, if I just want to print one to-do item, I can do that. I have a couple of options right here. If I want to print the full repository address instead of just the repository name, I can have it do that as well uh, so that I have that address and prepare information. If I, just, if I want it to say prepared by Bruce Busby, I can check that and have it print that as well for that to-do list. Okay, now I'm going to come back to the to-do list, uh, show you a couple of other, uh, other options in a little bit, but I'm going to move on for a second. And I'm going to go to a feature here under the list menu. Instead of the to-do list, I'm going to come down here to one called the correspondence list. And I noticed in the poll that the correspondence list is actually the least used of any of the, the features that were mentioned in the poll. What the correspondence list does is it gives you a way to keep track inside of Roots Magic of correspondence that you have had with other researchers. So I can come in and I can say I want to add some new correspondence to my correspondence list and I can enter a one-line description. What is this correspondence? Now this is similar to the to-do item. Okay, it's, it's very, one of the things you may need to do is correspond with somebody. What this is doing is saying, these are people that I actually have corresponded with. So I can enter a description of that correspondence. Uh, you know, asked, asked Aunt Mary uh, for a copy of her database, whatever. 
Again, you have that personal file number, which is your unique uh, number. It's optional. Use it for whatever you want. Then you can choose what type of correspondence was this. Was it mail, snail mail? In other words, did I write a letter and put a stamp on it and mail it off? Or was it email? Or was it by telephone? Or was it a fax? Or was it other? Uh, other kind of is the catch-all for everything else. So I can choose what type of correspondence, and then I can choose was this correspondence that I sent, or was it something I received? So if I'm sending out a letter to somebody, I can go ahead and say, this is some correspondence that I sent out. Uh, if I got a letter from somebody asking for some information, I can go ahead and say, this is some mail that I received, or email that I received. And of course, you want to track the date you received it. And then you have your free field where you can type whatever you want. Go into as much detail as you want about this letter, this email, this fax, this phone call that you sent or received. Okay. The next section right here is who was it with? And again, just like with the to-do list, I can correspond with a repository or an address. So if I sent a letter or received a letter from Aunt Martha, I would choose select address and select Martha's address. Okay. If I sent a letter to the, the county department of health requesting a birth certificate, I would say I corresponded with a repository and then select that repository or enter that repository if I haven't already and do that. Now as for the details, this is where I might want to say I contact, I, I send a letter to the county department of health asking for a certified copy of uh, so and so's birth certificate. I sent them a check, check number 1234 in the amount of $12, which is the price they uh, quoted me to receive this birth certificate. So you can keep track of the fact that you requested this birth certificate. Finally, you have a field down here for a file name. Now this is useful if you have, if you, let's say you've sent out a letter. Let's say you typed up a letter in Word. Well, you come in and you say, I wrote a letter to Aunt Martha and I did this and I mail, and you, you write a little bit about it in the details. And there is no size limit uh, for this detail field. You know, you probably don't want to, you know, you probably don't want to write a, you know, 500,000 character note in there, but if you wanted to, you could. Uh, but if you happen to write a letter in Word, what this lets you do is go ahead and browse your computer and select that Word document and actually attach that Word document to this correspondence record right here. Now, that's great because when I later go back in and save this and I come in later, when I go back into that, I can just click the open button and it will open up my Word document with the letter that I happened to write. Okay, so it actually lets you link to the physical copy of the, of the file or the document. Now, it doesn't have to be a Word document. It could be a PDF file. If you receive the fax and you scanned it in as an image, it could be that. It doesn't really matter what file format you use. What will happen when you click on Open is RootsMagic will tell Windows, hey, Windows, whatever program opens this type of file, open it up so that I can look at it and see it, whether it's Word opening a Word file, Excel opening an Excel file, Acrobat opening a PDF, or whatever. So that's the correspondence list or correspondence log. That's, uh, it's a nice little way to be able to keep track of who you are corresponding with uh, as you write to them and hear back from them. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next thing. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is we've, we've kind of talked a little bit about some reports, how to find what kinds of things we might want to be looking for. We've talked about the to-do list and the correspondence list, which basically let me keep track of the things I'm doing, what I need to look for, who I've corresponded with, and so on. So let's go ahead and now actually talk about, let's do the research. Let's go try to find that information. So the first thing I'm going to show here is web search. And web search is one of the views that comes 
uh, along with Roots Magic, you have your main navigation views, pedigree, family, descendants, and so on. Keep in mind, this database is a sample database for the most part, and so the people that are in this are not real people. So these searches are not going to necessarily come up. If, if it comes up with a good match, uh, it's a coincidence. Okay, what web search lets me do though is choose from a number of different websites that I want to search for. And what I do is I select what website I want to search. Do I want to search Ancestry? Do I want to search Family Search? Do I want to search Find a Grave, Footnote, Genealogy Bank, Roots Web, World Vital Records? Roots Magic also allows you to search some more generic sites like Bing. Google and Yahoo. Okay, you can also come down and actually create your own search providers. So if there's a site that we don't have built in, for example, Ellis Island is one we don't have built in. We did talk about this in a previous uh, in a previous webinar on how to go ahead and add these. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of spend really any time on showing you how to add your own. Just suffice it to say, you can go into Manage Search Providers click on custom search providers and click add and then just follow the directions to add your own. So I could go ahead and select a person and when I highlight a person in the list, Roots Magic is going to search whichever search site I've asked it to search. Now there's a little, a little check box up here. Make sure you have that checked. Um, there's a, some people it's not checked. It's much, it's much easier, much quicker to work when you have auto search checked because when I go and click on another person, it immediately goes and does that search for that person right here for me. Okay, if I don't have, if I don't have that checked, I have to click on the person, then come click on the button. So it's two steps if I don't have that checked. Okay, now one thing that's nice is as I am working and doing searches on these sites, when I find information on a person and I go in and I'm looking at that website at that information, I can come and double click on that person and open up their edit screen. So I can actually see my data that I have for that person and compare it to what's there in that search screen, in that web, that web search screen. Now keep in mind this web search is basically just going to that particular website. So if I change this to Ancestry, what this is doing is it is doing an Ancestry search for whoever I've got highlighted. So it would be the same as you going to Ancestry.com, typing in the person's name, and looking at the results there. Okay? The difference is that Roots Magic makes it easier because you don't have to keep going in and typing in each name and each birth year and each death year and so on. So I, and I can easily just kind of switch from site to site and from, from place to place looking at the results for one particular person or I can pick one particular site and just go click on each individual person to actually see the results for that person there. Okay. Now, one of the things that, that you might encounter is, let's say you go to Ancestry, and let's say you don't have uh, an Ancestry account. Well, what you might do is you might find some results, and if you find the results, you might want to, instead of, um, instead of having to write down this, you might actually want to go into that person's to-do list and actually say I want to add a new task and the task is look at such and such census and when you when you choose where to look for that select your repository create a repository for ancestry okay now let's say let's say I want to actually I actually want to look at this one I, I need to let me go actually hop out here for just a second make sure what it is Let's say I actually want to check that 1930 federal census. I can say add a task, check 1930 federal census, and put whatever details on. 
And then I can say select a repository, and I'm going to choose Ancestry is where I need to do that, and click OK. Okay. Now what's nice about this is one of those things that I showed you before. I go into the to-do list, and I come into lists, and I'm going to go down to my to-do list. That's what I'm going to print is my to-do list. And I am going to say I only want to print things at a single repository, and I'm going to choose Ancestry. So in other words, show me everything I need to do on Ancestry. Generate the report. There is a list of whatever I need to do on Ancestry. What I need to do it for, who I need to do it for, what the status and priority are, the where, and if I had entered more details in the, in the details and results field, that would be displayed there as well. What this means is when I go to the Family History Library or to uh, another location that has Ancestry, I can actually print this to-do list and take this and actually do my Ancestry lookups at the library without having to try to remember what did I need to look up on Ancestry. I can actually just take my to-do list that I've added to each person as I've gone along. Okay, last thing I want to cover. Now, what I'm going to show you next actually is not, uh, is not a specific Roots Magic feature. This is a program called GenSmarts. GenSmarts is from another company, but it's a really nice little program. Now, GenSmarts, when you install it, normally you would run it as a standalone program. You would go off and run GenSmarts just like you run Roots Magic and the GenSmarts program would come up and it would say what database do you want it to analyze. And you could say I want you to look at this Roots Magic database and GenSmarts would come up and it would say here are all the names in that file uh, and here are some research suggestions for all these different people in your file. And so you get this big list of people. Well, what we have done at Roots Magic is we have worked with uh, the GenSmarts developers, and we have integrated the GenSmarts searching into Roots Magic. Okay, so when I click on Tools, you'll see down here there's an item called GenSmart Suggestion. It's an actual menu item in Roots Magic. Okay, now. If you happen to be wanting to use this a lot, you can actually add the GenSmarts button on your toolbar. So I'm going to give you, I'll give you a little quick uh, refresher on how to do this. I can point at any button on my toolbar and click the right mouse button, not the one that would select this item, but the other button, and I could choose Customize. Now, once I do that, that opens up the Customize button, and I want to go to the commands. In other words, I want to see the commands that I can add to my toolbar. Now these categories match my menu items, file edit lists and so on. Okay, GenSmarts is under the tools menu, and so when I click on that I will see GenSmarts suggestions as one of my commands, and all I have to do is click and drag that up to my toolbar. Okay, go ahead and close it, and now I have a GenSmarts button on my toolbar. That's how I happen to have added my return to the home person button on my toolbar the exact same way. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I've actually added a handful. I've added a handful of of people from my actual database into this temporary uh, sample file, this fake sample file. So I can show you kind of what you can do with GenSmarts. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and highlight a person. So let's say I want to find more about Stephen Busby. I look at his information, and all I really have on him is I know his spouse name is Elizabeth. He was born in South Carolina, and here's his marriage to Elizabeth. That's all I know about him. Now, there is other information. You know, we know his children and when and where his children were born and so on. That's what Jim Smarts excels at, is it will look at this person that I'm interested in and say, based on when and where he was born and married and died and where his kids were born and all of this, based on that information, 
here are places you ought to consider looking for more information. So I'm going to highlight him and I'm going to click the GenSmarts button. Okay, and what that's going to do is that's going to start up GenSmarts. You're going to see there's the GenSmarts. It is loading, but instead of bringing up the full-blown GenSmarts program, Roots Magic is only going to show me the suggestions for Stephen Busby specifically. Okay, in other words, it's not it's not showing me everything about that I need to research for his wife, his kids, you know, his 14th cousins. It's only showing me what I need to research for him. So it's saying I really ought to look in the Arkansas 1830 census. Now when that's highlighted down here, it's telling me why it's making that suggestion. And it's saying, well, he's born in 1817, but he's got a child that was born in Arkansas around 1839. So there's a chance he might appear in the 1830 census. The 1840 census is going to be the same reason. Now as I scroll down, it's going to give me a little information about that and what that family might look like in that census. Okay, alternative spellings for the name that might appear there as well. Okay, and it's going to say, here are the two places that it knows you could find these. It knows you could find it on Ancestry or in Dallas, Texas. It happens to be the Dallas Public Library. Um, but those are the two places that it knows that you can find those. Okay, well, let's go ahead and look at some other ones. The Arkansas land patents. It's saying, oh, you might want to research Arkansas land patents because he was married in 1840, probably in Arkansas because he's got these kids that were, that were born in Arkansas. And it goes on down and it'll show you things like this record is available at the U.S. Bureau of Land Management. Okay, so you can see it's making a lot of suggestions. Now it doesn't know whether my Stephen Busby is in any of these records. It's just saying based on looking at this person and the places and the dates and the people around him, these are places you might want to look at. Now I see a question, is it U.S. only? Yes, currently it's not U.S. only, but it is U.S. heavily. Okay, there are some suggestions. It does know about some records in other English-speaking countries in Canada, England, Australia. There are future versions of GenSmarts that are being worked on where um, where they will be allowing other people to go ahead and add new record types. And at that point, I suspect uh, the the U.S. centric nature of of Gen Smarts will will start to disappear, but currently it is quite heavily U.S. based. Okay, so let's go ahead and do an example. Now, if you know, I showed you I showed you how this will this will actually show me where the various records are. Now, if a record is available online, in other words, if if Gen Smarts knows where it can actually find these kind of records this button will be enabled to look online. Okay, so I, I'm going to go ahead and say, yeah, let's go ahead and look online. In other words, what I'm saying is, you've suggested I look in the Arkansas land patents for Stephen Busby. I'm going to say, okay, let's look. Look. And so GenSmarts is actually going online to the Arkansas land patents to see if it can find them. And it opened that window in a different on my other monitors, so let me drag that over here. Okay, here is the browser window that GenSmarts just opened up for me, and it shows me, hey look, we did find some Stephen Busby's in the Arkansas land patent records. And you know, I can go in and I can say, well, let's look and see what, what all is available, and it'll show me some details about this, and in some of these I can actually say, yeah, show me an image. Okay. So here's my image. There's my image of this particular land patent record, and I can go in there and look and see, is this my Stephen Busby? In this case, yes, it actually is my Stephen Busby. But I can go down here, and I can actually see this. I can scroll on down, and I can see, you know, that I, testimony, I, Franklin Pierce, President of the United States, have, you know, signed this, uh, uh, this land patent. Okay, so... This is what GenSmarts is going to help me do. Now, not every record is going to be available online. 
it's suggesting I look at the Orangeburg, South Carolina County death records. Okay, those aren't available online. Where are they? Well, let's go ahead and scroll down and I can see they happen to be at the Family History Library in Salt Lake City and this, this person may show up in the book and here's the volumes. There's my call number and so on and this is where I can go look, since it's not available online, this is where I can go look to see if my Stephen Busby happens to show in those records. Now, what GenSmarts will try to do is if the data is available online on a free website, it will try that first. That's where it will look. If it's only available on a pay website, such as Ancestry, then it's going to actually have to do that. Now, if it has to go to Ancestry, yes, you would have to have an Ancestry account to go see that data. Um, but as I mentioned when we were doing the web search, and this is where I really use this feature, is let's say this is suggesting I look at the Arkansas 1830 census and the only places that I can look are to go to Dallas or to look on Ancestry. Well, I don't have Ancestry at home. And so I can say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and add this suggestion to that person's to-do list. So I click on that. It automatically fills this in, check the Arkansas 1830 census, puts my, my personal file number in there, gives me a priority open. Where do I need to do it? I'm going to go in, oops, I'm going to go in and select a repository, Ancestry, and I can put whatever details and results I want in there. So this might actually be um, something where I might have copied and pasted this to put in that to-do item. But I now have this suggestion as a to-do item. So that when I come out of this and I go into my reports and I go into my lists and I go into my to-do list and I say add a single repository ancestry, okay, Right there, Stephen Busby, I need to check the Arkansas 1830 census. Okay, and any of those details that I had wanted to paste in, I could have pasted those in right there. I can print this to-do list out. I could take this to-do list with me to the Family History Library or to my local library if it happens to have an Ancestry account, and I can go do my searches from my to-do list and try to find those records on Ancestry without me having to necessarily have an Ancestry account in my house. Okay, so that's an overview of some of the things that you can do um, to help you with your research. I see um, in the questions, I see our support people telling us we don't do support on GenSmarts. I'm supposed to mention that to you. Um, Basically, GenSmarts, being from another company, it, you, know, you, would go, you would go to them for your research. So uh, hopefully our tech support people are happy now that I, that I mentioned that. Um, so, um, but, but, so what, hopefully what you've learned is there are a lot of ways, a lot of reports to help you look for what information you might be missing. In other words, where do I need to go find some more? Um, You've, got, you've been exposed now to the to-do list, so you know there is a place to keep track of that research that you are actually, uh, that you are actually needing to do. Your, who you are corresponding with, you can keep track of that. You can use web search to look up online manually by clicking on a person and doing that. Or you can use a tool like Jim Smarts, um, which helps make research recommendations and will help you search those sites uh, a little bit more intelligently, a little bit more efficiently to try to find that information that you're looking for. Um, so, uh, Mike, are there any other questions? Okay, <clears throat> I've just been looking through there. A lot of them I'm, I'm looking through here, these are questions that you did address in the webinar. Um, some questions about GenSmarts, people who've bought it in the past, um, how do they get updates to it? Oh, okay. Um, the current version of GenSmarts 
is version 2. Point something. Uh, they they use the weird numbering like we do, the something point something point something point something. The, the current major version of GenSmarts is version 2. So what you can do is if you go run GenSmarts separately, in other words, if you go to your start menu and go to GenSmarts and run it standalone, not inside of Roots Magic, it will come up and tell you if there's an update available. And up, their updates include not just updates to the functionality of the program, but will include updates to their, their database of these sites. And so you, you definitely want to keep that up to date. If you have version 1 of GenSmarts 1 point something, you will want to contact uh, GenSmarts to, uh, to uh, order an upgrade from them. Um, I'm not sure what the price on the upgrade uh, from version 1 to version 2 is. Um, one little thing I, I want to mention, some people uh, have GenSmarts and they will contact us and they'll say that, um, that, uh, that Roots Magic is not detecting that GenSmarts is there. What happens is um, a, a competitor of ours, let's say, uh, used to sell Gen Smart specifically. I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you, Family Tree Maker. They, you, they have sold a copy of Gen Smarts, a special private Gen Smarts for Family Tree Maker. If you happen to have gotten that version, you will also need to contact Gen Smarts on an upgrade for that as well, because that particular version of Gen Smarts was dumbed down to only work with their program. The Gen Smarts that we happen to sell on our website, when you go to rootsmagic.com, if you order GenSmarts from our website, it's the full-blown GenSmarts. So it works not just with Roots Magic, but it works with all the, all the other genealogy products as well, and, and GEDCOM and everything. The one that the Family Tree Maker Ancestry sells only works with Family Tree Maker, and so that's why, if you have that version, that's why Roots Magic cannot see that version. Okay, any other questions? So oh, how much does it cost? On our website it's $29.95. Um, I'm not sure I'm not sure what the price is if you go directly to gensmarts.com. Um, I think it's a little bit more, but our price is $29.95 on for the GenSmarts program. Oh, we have one question about the web search. Can I store my logins and passwords in Roots Magic for my subscriptions? That is Ancestry and Footnote. Yes, if you enter your username and password in there, um, the, the web browser control that we use can save those um, usernames and passwords for you. Okay. Any last questions? Okay, well, thanks for attending. Um, we have another webinar next week. And so uh, you can always go to rootsmagic.com slash webinars uh, to see any of the past webinars, to watch any of the past webinars. They're always free. Uh, we never charge for those. Uh, well, unless you happen to want to buy the CDs, we actually have some CDs where we cram 10 webinars on each one. So we do have those if you want them that way. But uh, if you go to the website, the webinars are always free uh, to watch or download. So thanks for joining us and hope to see you again next week.